Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on DNS redundancy. I'm Lauren Malhoy. I'm the Director of Technical Content at Men and Mice. I just want to go over a few things before we get to the, the meat and potatoes, get to the real stuff, um, before I introduce our two esteemed guests today. So we're so glad to have you here today live. Um, please feel free to ask questions anytime using the Q&A panel, and we can either answer it right there in the panel, or we'll get it answered verbally live by uh, these two brilliant minds that we have with us today. Um, we're planning on just about a half hour session, a half hour of content or so. So there's going to be plenty of time for Q&A at the end as well, but uh, we'll do our best to answer questions as we go. Um, I did want to just let you all know that we, about a couple weeks ago, released version 10.3 of Maestro. Um, so our product and dev teams did just a fantastic job introducing some new and improved features, um, like the ability to do multi-factor authentication using either Azure AD or Okta. So the, uh, the vendors you're already using to do MFA, we just wanted to go ahead and integrate with those so that uh, you can just add us in and make sure that everything you're doing is as secure as possible. We've also extended support for DHCP v6 to Kea. So what we had with Microsoft DHCP v6 has now been extended. Um, so you can go ahead and use DHCP just like you would for IPv4 with your IPv6 environment. Um, we've made some huge improvements to our customers' ability to manage what we call cascading lists. So um, those custom properties that let you put in identity information in a lot of cases. Maybe it's geographic. Um, maybe it's about where the 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 server is, you know, within the rack, within the city, within the, the state, um, all sorts of identity information that you can get now with custom properties. So we're making that even easier to manage for all of you. And last but certainly not least is the topic of discussion for today, the XDNS redundancy capability. So we're going to dive into that more. I'm not going to talk about that too much right now, but we have totally rewritten it. Um, it is definitely improved, much easier to use. Um, so we'll let uh, Sigfus and Simon talk about that a little bit, though. Um, with that said, let's get to the introduction. Productions. Sigfus, our, uh, our CTO at Men and Mice. Sigfus, tell us a little bit about yourself and your role with Men and Mice. Yeah, so I joined Men and Mice uh, 25 ish years ago and uh, started in support, went on to development, uh, was kicked out of development because I was a crappy programmer, and went back into support and uh, became a VP of product management and now a CTO of the company. I think that's fantastic. Quite a journey. <laughs> it is a journey. I think everyone um, would probably appreciate that you've spent some time in support. I think uh, our customers will definitely appreciate that. I hope. Well, and then Simon Bell, thank you so much for being with us, coming over from Paceler. Will you tell us a little bit about yourself, your role, and then uh, maybe if you take over the screen share, tell us more about Paceler and PRTG. Sure. Happy to learn. Um... Thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me along. Uh, my name is Simon Bell. I'm a technology consultant with uh, Paceless uh, Alliances team. I've been with Paceless for about seven years. Uh, my um, background originally was from the, um, uh, the pre-sales department, and I've uh, since moved across into alliances. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things that we tried to do with our alliances. Um, program at Basler is to find companies who have technologies that complement PRTG. And we found really good um, synergy with men and mice and their Maestro and XDNS products. So uh, I hope you're going to enjoy what we're going to show you this afternoon. Before we get into the uh, technical details, for those of you who aren't familiar with Basler, I just thought to give you a little bit of background information uh, about the company and about our product. Um, Paisler was started in 1997 by a chap called uh, Dirk Paisler. Um, we, since then, we've grown to over 370 employees from uh, 25 countries. Our largest market is the US, followed by the DAC region, the UK, and Benelux. Uh, PRTG is in, uh, used, in use by companies of all sizes, from um, sort of small single-person consultancies uh, right through to uh, enterprise uh, size organizations. And we estimate that we've got something like 500,000 customers uh, around the world. 
We're headquartered in Nuremberg in Germany. Uh, we have uh, separate incorporated entities in the US and most recently of all in Malaysia, uh, serving the, the APAC region. And we've got uh, people and teams right around the world. As I say, we, we estimate we've got something like 500,000 users uh, spread across uh, about 300,000 installations. Um, and that boils down to about 100,000 customers. So we, we were, uh, uh, we're, we're quite a large player in the, uh, the, uh, the monitoring space. Our PRTG product line uh, consists of three main products. Our, um, our oldest and most venerable would be a PRTG network monitor. Uh, this is a, an on-prem solution um, that's uh, aimed at um, monitoring the entire uh, IT infrastructure and beyond. Um, the on-prem version scales up to about 10,000 sensors, and I'll explain a little bit more about sensors in a couple of minutes. Um, that's a, a perpetual licensing model, uh, and it can be run either uh, on-prem on a, a physical virtual server or in a private instance of a public cloud. For customers who need, um, uh, have got larger scale requirements, we have the PRTG Enterprise Monitor, uh, and that's aimed at customers who need 20,000 sensors and above. Uh, that's a subscription-based licensing model, and again, it can be run uh, either uh, on-prem or from uh, a cloud instance. And then finally, for those who don't want to run the infrastructure themselves, uh, we offer PRTG hosted monitors. So that's the same functionality, but it runs in Pacer's own uh, cloud and we take care of uh, actually running and managing the instance for you. So uh, sensors, what, what is a sensor? Well, in PRTG, a sensor, as well as being our unit of licensing, is an aspect of a device that you want to monitor. Uh, that includes all the things that you'd normally expect a monitoring tool to, to cover. So things like CPU load, disk space, uh, whether a service is up and running and so on. And that data can come from um, a, a wide variety of sources. Uh, obviously, we're very heavily involved in SNMP and WMI, but we also can uh, you use uh, data coming from APIs, and that's exactly what we do with uh, men and mice. We leverage their API to extract monitoring data. Um, we can also tap into industrial environments, so things like uh, Modbus or MQTT uh, information. And all of the types of sensor, of which there's around about 300, uh, are included in every PRTG license at no additional cost. So if you want to do something sophisticated like monitoring your VMware environment, all the sensors to do that are included without you needing to buy any, any add-ons. Now, with almost three type, 300 different types of sensor, uh, I would argue that PRTG has probably got the broadest range of any of the monitoring tools that are available. Uh, given our background and heritage, obviously we're very strong in the traditional IT space, so servers, storage, networking, and so on, uh, we can monitor. We also have dedicated sens sensors for cloud platforms. So if you're running in AWS, Azure and the like, uh, we've got specialist sensors to, uh, to keep an eye on that infrastructure. We've also got the ability to uh, extract information from IoT platforms. So things like MQTT, uh, we have a, a connector for Node-RED um, and uh, as I've already mentioned, the, the REST API information. More recently, we've moved into the industrial IoT space with uh, out of the box support for things like Modbus, MQTT and uh, OPC UA. And we're also involved in the healthcare sector with specialist uh, support for specialist protocols like DICOM and HL7. These are the protocols that are responsible for moving uh, medical images around the networks. If you could have an MRI scan, for example, um, it's uh, DICOM and HL7 that make sure the images get to the clinician's um, workstation for, for your review. Now, as well as being very broad in our depth, um, PRTG also goes deep into the monitored infrastructure. So with our uh, standard and custom sensor types and our uh, ability to 
gather information through APIs and via scripts. We also, uh, we can go quite deep into the infrastructure. We can only go so far. And occasionally, uh, administrators need to, uh, to look a little bit deeper. And this is where our relationship with our alliance partners come into play. And we, uh, we have something like 40 alliance partners that we work closely with. And uh, Men and Mice are a, a great example of that alliance relationship. And uh, with that, I'll hand over to Sigfus to tell you a little bit more about um, uh, Men and Mice and their products. So Simon, before we before I start my presentation, so does uh, you had like a, these different uh, products, basically like a hosted and uh, on-prem and cloud. Mm -hmm. So support for Maestro would that be you know in all these different flavors of of the product? Yeah, absolutely. The uh, the sensors that we're using to um, integrate with you guys uh, are available across all of the platforms, and as I say, at no extra cost. Okay, sounds good. So uh, let me see. You see my screen? Mm -hmm. I see it. And Lauren said, you know, I was not supposed to do any slides, but I'm going to start with a couple of slides and break my promise. So uh, we start with this here. I mean, it's uh, it's never DNS, um, uh, but actually DNS is very often the, the reason why your network goes offline. And redundancy is obviously a very a critical thing of your uh, of your DNS, and uh, because if DNS fails, everything pretty much fails. Uh, it, it applies both to your internal processes and applications, but maybe more importantly, like uh, your internet presence. So uh, this is it's like a, if a page takes more than three seconds to load, people go just up to the next site. You know, they they just give up. There's no, uh, you're not going to wait for like a, a few minutes until a page page loads. And if, if your DNS goes down, uh, then you're off the network and uh, uh, people are going to move just to your competitors for uh, for information. So there's a few ways. I mean, basically, uh, DNS admins would like to get uh, redundancy for DNS. And you have a, a couple of ways to do that. You can, If you're hosting your own DNS, what you can do is you can take multiple servers and put them in multiple locations. So in multiple data centers, and maybe to add a bit more redundancy, have them of different types. So maybe in terms of like a, the most familiar product, maybe you have a bind server in one location and then maybe a power DNS in another or, or Akamai or something. So uh, you would do that with if you're hosting your own DNS. Now, uh, DNS is a pretty critical component of your network and also uh, it's uh, it's prone to attacks. So DDoS attacks on your DNS are pretty uh, common. So why not just have someone else take care of DNS? So host your DNS with someone else. So it's going to be someone else's problem, but obviously if their DNS goes down, you are off, off the network. So maybe not the best redundancy, but it's someone's, someone else's problem to take care of the DNS servers and make sure they're running. Now, what, what we see with our customer base and just in the in the market in general is that uh, people are moving to more cloud-based DNS services. And two reasons maybe for that. Uh, one is it's it's very it's highly redundant and very scalable services. So where you're talking about Akamai's uh, Edge DNS or AWS Route 3 or Azure DNS, these are extremely uh, high performing available DNS services. Uh, they have also some advanced functionality which you might be uh, willing to use or want to use. But maybe primarily it's like a, uh, now we have a very, really robust uh, geo uh, with some geo cap capabilities, DNS in, in different locations. Uh, and the next step may be above that, you know, uh, we have a cloud-based DNS, but there's like actually one more step you can take in terms of redundancy, which would be to use a hybrid DNS. So that means that you have an on-prem DNS, and then you have also a DNS in, in the cloud or maybe using two different cloud providers. So take manamas.com, we're going to host it with AWS Route 3 and also with Akamai's Edge DNS. So that might be, I mean, if one goes down, probably the other one, other one is going to stay up. So um, uh, you're pretty safe there. Now, if, if we take a look at uh, the DNS with uh, the Fortune 500 companies and how they're doing the DNS, it's a very interesting uh, statistics we get from that. So 28.5% are using their own DNS. So basically in a data center, they have their own DNS servers. The, the first example there on my previous slide, so fine. Uh, a large portion are using 
cloud-based DNS. So Akama is Edge DNS is the, uh, is the most popular one, but we also routed the three, uh, Azure, Azure DNS, other DNS, and, and more are in that mix. Some are using hosted DNS, so maybe could say that this would be a, like a traditional hosting DNS. So we have a, a data center somewhere and they, they're running DNS service there. It, they don't have the cloud capabilities, but this may be more redundant than your own DNS. But then the two wedges that uh, stick out there are the on-prem cloud and the multi-cloud. So a very small percentage of uh, the enterprise or the Fortune 500 are actually uh, have a highly redundant setup. Uh, only these two, uh, like a 7% with the on-prem and cloud and 4.5 with the multi-cloud. And you kind of wonder why, why, why is this the case? Because uh, back to the um, first slide there, there, there is no way it's a DNS, but it, DNS is, is very often the, the reason why things go bad. And we've had some high profile DNS uh, incidents over the last few years. And I just highlighted the ones who maybe got the most attention. Uh, Dyne back in 2016, when they had a, like a massive DDoS attack and they went down Netflix, CNN, you know, Airbnb, a lot of high profile sites, even Amazon uh, went down with Dyne in, in 2016. Cloudflare went down in July 2020, it's a different uh, reason. With Cloudflare, it was that uh, there was a routing issue, or maybe a switch or something that went bad, went bad and meant that the DNS servers went down. Actually, for a partial, like a portion of the of the company, but still, it went. Uh, it brought down a lot of like a high profile sites. Twitter uh, uh, and and then others went down for a short period of time, and then in 2021 October, Facebook their own their DNS servers went offline. Again, it wasn't DNS, but it was DNS. So it, it was that uh, someone was making a, a, a routing change on the on the network and brought down or removed the network that was hosting the DNS servers. So actually, there was no one could access the DNS servers, and uh, it took some time for them to to correct that. So if a DNS server or DNS provider can fail, uh, both your own and also cloud. Why are you only using one? Like if you go back to the previous slide, we had the 50, more than 50% of the enterprises are using uh, cloud DNS. Why not, why only use one? Why not two? And there is obviously a few reasons you know, for that. Cost, this, I, I don't think cost is an issue there, but complexity is an issue because it's, very, it's much more complex to maintain two separate versions of your DNS because they don't synchronize. So you have uh, maybe one with Akamai, and on one with uh, Azure DNS. And if you make a change, you have to change them both. If one is down and you change the other one, you need to make sure that you change the one that was was down when it comes back up. And so uh, like uh, these kinds of things. And so then also, is, yeah. Are you saying that the cloud providers aren't uh, just itching to help us synchronize with other cloud providers, which are their competitors? <laughs> <laughs> you could even say that, yeah. <laughs> I'll but, say uh, you don't have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, maybe back to the uh, I mean, all over the place, but uh, DNS is a highly redundant uh, platform. So if you're running like a primary, secondary setup, I mean, and you distribute your DNS servers all over the place, it's actually a, a, a decent setup and uh, should be uh, available uh, most of the time. But if the primary server goes down, we can't update the, your DNS. So that's uh, an issue. With that, and then with the the uh, the, the cloud providers, uh, I mean they're not they haven't pr uh, implemented the the, the uh, primary secondary concepts, so uh, they, they're not real DNS servers uh, in that way. But I mean with the uh, why not uh, why only use uh, one? It's also that if you're using an API and that this is the common uh, setup that you're using uh, an API uh, using some script Ansible or something to update your DNS. And now you have multiple endpoints to connect to and your scripts have to know how to deal with different types. XDNS to the rescue. Uh, we implemented XDNS after the Dyn attack in 2017. And uh, it, it is a really nice functionality. And like you said, Lauren, we improved it quite a bit in the recent version of the last version of Maestro. So it gives us the ability to take a zone and put it with multiple pro providers. So MetaMask.com 
instead of having it with Azure or Akamai, we can have it with both. And uh, XDNS takes care of the synchronization between these two providers. We can have more. It's also the this one entry point uh, to orchestrate changes. So instead of having two APIs to talk to, you have one API, which is the Ma Maestro API. And we take care of synchronizing the data to the different uh, underlying DNS platforms. And then last but not least is the, if there's an outage, you can still operate as normal. You can make a change. And when the, uh, the platform which was unavailable comes back up, you can then, uh, we will then in the background synchronize data back uh, to, the, uh, to that platform. So with that said, Let's do a little bit of a demo. So now you can see the smile on Lauren's face. So now I'm finally uh, doing what I was supposed to do. So uh, with you know I love a demo. So with with uh, Maestro, uh, let's go into the configuration and the XDNS profiles. So what you do like a, with XDNS is like a two concepts. One is a profile, and the profile dictates uh, if a uh, if you put a, a zone in a profile, it uh, the profile will say, okay, this zone should be on these DNS servers. And, and if we put the, uh, the the zone in the profile, we'll make sure, I mean, we might even create the zone with Azure and uh, or AWS or something, if the profile dictates that. Or if the zone already exists on these, on these providers, then it will uh, update the zone and make sure it's, uh, the, all the copies are in sync. So if I move this nice uh, picture of myself here away, I can then create a profile. So profile has a name, test, and then the profile has some DNS servers. And in my case here, I have a bind server. I'm gonna take that uh, into the profile. And then I have an Azure, uh, DNS, Azure DNS account here, and I'm gonna take uh, an instance here into that as well. We can, in the profile, we can say all, also if it is supposed to accept or reject external changes. So if it's like a primary source of changes uh, or a secondary. And this is important because in some cases, uh, comp, uh, if you have a, a zone which is on, let's say on a bind server and with AWS, uh, we, you might not want to have uh, give people the capabilities of logging into, the, uh, into AWS and make a change there. So if they make a change in AWS in Route 3, we don't want that change to be replicated to the bind server. So this is like a, uh, based on feedback from our customers. So basically now I have a couple of DNS servers in the profile. I'm gonna say if there is a, uh, if there's a conflict uh, between uh, the two instances, what are we supposed to do? So basically conflict might be uh, a record with the same name but of different type, like an A and a C name or something, but this is good. So I'm gonna just have a merge record create and uh, uh, with Maestro, we always prompt for a save comment and uh, test here and the profile has been created. So the, I said that there are two concepts of uh, XDNS. So basically one is a profile and then how the zones are treated with a, the with a profile. So if I go back in or into the DNS part here and I scroll to the bottom, I have this uh, zone here, the very best movies.net. And this is a zone which is on Azure and also on my bind server. If I open up the Azure, we can see that it has the these NS records and it also has one A record. If I open up the on-prem version, it has a different NS record, but the same A record. And I can take these two here and I can say, I'm gonna add it to a profile and I'm gonna set, uh, the, it's gonna be uh, the critical zones here. Add a save comment, test. And what happens now in the background is that Maestro will take, uh, will talk to the bind server and also Azure, take a look at the DNS records in both and say, okay, uh, this is now moving forward. This is going to be the same zone. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take uh, the the uh, the records which are which match, and they're going to both be in here. And I'm, I'm also going to merge the NS records uh, from the two uh, providers. So let's see. Just, uh, the I, demo I, effect. I love that uh, the preflight check though, Sigfus. I mean, anytime you can include a, a preflight checker, what happens if I <laughs> actually click OK or add, um, you know, to, to know those things in advance and be able to either remediate if it's a true error or, you know, just know that it's going to happen so that you're not um, messing up your 
your entire infrastructure, right? Taking it down while you're building in redundancy, I think is a it's a good thing. Okay, yeah. So this is taking some time, maybe because it's hosted in the um, in the cloud, the, uh, the the server, and I didn't pay too much. But give it a, a couple of seconds. Uh, well, you can also just uh, swipe to uh, to Simon and have him because the zone now with the other one, the best movies at net, it has already been uh, added to a profile, and this might take some time just to look at the synchronous zone between uh, Mount Prem and also my uh, my cloud instance. But Simon, if you just take now yep. and uh, demonstrate the uh, the uh, how we are monitoring, and this might be a good example, you know, how we're monitoring the uh, the XDNS through uh, using PLTG. Sure. Let me just grab the screen share. Okay, so this is a home screen of PRTG Network Monitor. Um, at this point, I'd normally go through a, a full demo that would take about an hour, but uh, that's not why we're here today. So I'll just cut to the chase. If I go to uh, what we refer to as the device tree, uh, here we can see that I'm monitoring various aspects of my uh, men and mice DDI environment. So up here at the top, um, we've got some uh, Python script sensors uh, that are monitoring various aspects of our DDI infrastructure, but also uh, we're using our standard REST sensors to uh, retrieve the same information. So if I just cl uh, click on the uh, the group for the REST sensors, we can see the information that we're gathering from uh, Maestro all through the through the API. So this is the standard sort of information that you'd expect uh, to be interested in from a, a DHCP, uh, DNS and IP management environment. So we're looking to see um, how many leases we currently have active, how many addresses we have uh, still available in our pools, uh, the number of defined DHCP ranges. These are things that could give you a, a, a heads up in a security situation. If, if all of a sudden you uh, discover that you had more DHCP ranges available and it had not been authorized, then it could be an indication that there was something uh, unpleasant happening. You'll notice on some of these gauges that we have some colored uh, regions and these are thresholds that we've assigned. So in the case of our available DHCP addresses, we're getting PRTG to uh, keep an eye on how many addresses are available in the pool. If it drops below a certain threshold, it'll let the administrator know that um, they need to either uh, do some cleanup on the existing allocated addresses or provision some more. Um, so that any of the thresholds that we set on these values, we can trigger uh, notifications on. Now, as well as the... Um, the general monitoring of our IPAM infrastructure, we've also got some sensors set up specifically for uh, XDNS. So if I expand the XDNS group, oops, we can see that, um, as Sigfus mentioned, we've actually got two instances um, here. We've got a, an on-prem uh, DNS instance and uh, an Azure instance. So what PRTG is doing here, it's actually checking for name resolution from those uh, individual uh, DNS servers. And with PRTG, we can take information from the device tree here and represent it on uh, dashboards or what we refer to as maps. So here we've got a, um, a map for the best movies company. And at the top, we've got our DDI information that we've just seen, so our um, DHCP pools and so on. Um, we're keeping track of the, the health of our pools at the moment. We're not short of addresses, so the traffic light is green. And there's a history of the addresses that we've uh, issued over the last few days. And down at the bottom, we're just checking some uh, infrastructure information, so making sure our DHCP servers are online, again, uh, validating the number of zones that we have available. Our Active Directory site links are working correctly. Um, we don't currently have any open change requests. In uh, Maestro, it's possible to raise change requests to have uh, changes go through a, a, an authenticated change management process. So uh, we currently don't have any uh, available. 
Over on the right hand side here, we're actually checking our DNS service. So while I was speaking, then it looks like uh, something has changed. Um, our name resolution is still working and our DNS servers are still online, but it looks like there's a problem developed with the service itself. So if I go back to my devices, yep, it looks like we're not getting uh, resolution from one of our DNS servers. So uh, if I hand back to Sigfus now, we can show how we can dive into the uh, that particular problem and troubleshoot what's what's been happening. Yes. So this was, uh, uh, let me see here. So actually the, the internet didn't go down actually, but uh, I did some, I just had some uh, uh, some script in the background that killed my DNS server so we could see what happens when that- Oh, uh, sick, don't that, give the secrets away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 just like a an honest guy. That's the uh, that's the thing. <laughs> but uh, let me just uh, share my screen here again. Nothing and like a planned uh, outage for for a demo. Uh, like I mean, that, that is uh, how things should actually work. So, um, am I back on on the on the screen here? Yep, we see my yep. screen. Okay, so we can see that the 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 best movies dot net, uh, the zone that uh, Simon has been monitoring, is uh, a part of uh, the extraneous critical zones. And if I go into the admin section here in Maestro, we can see that uh, my DNS service is down. And we can also see if I go back into the DNS part here and select the zone, we can see on the right hand side here that uh, the the server is offline. So. The zone is an XDNS zone. I only see one copy of the zone here in, in Maestro, but it's an it's a it's an XDNS zone and it's hosted on these two providers. One of them is offline, but the other one is not. And which means that uh, I could still go ahead and I can open the zone, I can make changes to it, uh, and uh, then when once the my bind instance comes back online, Maestro will take all the uh, all the records that have been changed uh, during the outage and replicate them back into the into the bind instance, which means that uh, all your automation uh, is still gonna work and uh, and all your users, the, you know, DNS is still working. Like uh, you can, could see in, in Simon's demonstration, the, the name resolution was working and you still had two DNS servers, even though one of, one of them was down, you could still like uh, DNS was functioning fine. So it's critical that your users, if you have uh, tons, tons of users, maybe all change in DNS or or have a heavy automation uh, provisioning DNS, that it, it runs smooth even though there's a one of the DNS service or services not available. And then, as I said, you know, after the uh, after the uh, we detect that the other service comes back online, uh, we will do the synchronization into the uh, into the other provider. So that concludes pretty much the demo unless there are questions from you Lauren. I, no that was excellent thank you both so much I think um, you know I think it's awesome to be able to see kind of that degraded service but of course everything's still working um, and then of course to see it come back is the, the green traffic light is always you know going to give everyone a, a sigh of relief as well um, so just just awesome stuff um, and you know as I said in, in the chat too being able to see um, not only, you know, XDNS or, or DNS services specifically, but being able to see what servers are down or what services or routers or switches, seeing all of that in one place through PRTG, I think is is just the most powerful um, part of that, that monitoring tool rather than just the simple dashboard within Maestro. Um, we can see maybe, you know, there's a router down that's causing the DNS out outage to begin with. Um, so I think that stuff is just really powerful. So thank you both. Sigfus, I did want to ask, um, you know, I, obviously the redundancy here for DNS is, is key that's a key use case um you know are there other use cases that we've seen customers using xdns for yeah so uh, what we have seen is uh, so we in initially we de developed this for the external dns so that was the uh, that was the key here for us because of the dying outage and uh, we detected you know there was like a, a lot of our customers are relying obviously heavily on external DNS to be available. A lot of them moving to cloud providers. 
So this was important to to have this uh, uh, have this uh, for the external DNS. But we see increasingly uh, interest in using XDNS internally. So to bridge the, the internal DNS to AWS and and the Azure, because there is a concept there like a private zones in these pl platforms, and you want to provide local resolution to instances in the cloud. So instead, instead of the instance in the cloud being, having to go to an on-prem DNS server for resolution, they could use the, 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 the built-in service in the cloud platform for the DNS resolution. And we do the bridging with the XDNS like from the on-prem on into, the, into the cloud. That's awesome. Yeah, and I'm glad you did mention kind of the internal versus external, um, and that XDNS will actually work with both. I mean, I know we mentioned hybrid, but I think there's a there's sometimes confusion between you know when we're talking about people managing their own DNS internally for you know their coworkers and things like that, as opposed to what they're offering their customers and the services. Um, so yes, thank you for that, um, Simon. I did want to give you a chance too. Is there anything else you wanted to say about PRTG or um, in general? Uh, um, I want to give you the chance to to make your plugs before we sign off here. Uh, I'm just going to fly the flag for the alliances um, side of things. Um, the PRTG natively can pull information in from um, pretty much anything that has an IP address, either supports a standard protocol like SNMP or WMI, or has an API that we could uh, hook into. And that's where the real power comes because we can work with you know, fantastic tools like Maestro and XDNS to just give that extra depth to the, uh, to the monitoring environment. Um, so tools like uh, Maestro that are, are API first are, are just a joy to work with. You know, it's trivial to set up monitoring for, for something with a, a properly designed API. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, it's uh, I've actually set it up and done the demo, and it, it just took me a few minutes, even the first time running it. So it was incredibly easy to set up that that uh, custom REST API sensor. So, um, you know, great work to your your product teams as well. Thank you. All right. Well, unless anyone has anything else, I think we will close it down for now. Um, thank you so much, Simon Sigfus. This was excellent, and uh, we look forward to hearing from all of you. Thanks very much, everybody.